Today I want to introduce our next session. The theme is Maximizing Sales and Loyalty with Seamless Omnichannel Experiences. In this session, we'll look at how the loyalty strategies you can use to boost retention and repeat purchases through improved personalization. Please welcome our panelists. We have Angel Singh, the VP of Customer Experience, Personalization and UX at Petco. Katie Persino, the VP of E-Commerce and Site at J. Crew, And our moderator, Jay Topper, Head of Innovation and Strategy at Fabric. I would a nice warm welcome for our panelists. All right, I'm going to start with uh, some introductions and I'll introduce myself first. Uh, I've just started my third career, so for the first 20 years of my career, going back to 1979, I was in the United States Army and the United States Coast Guard. From 1996 until 2024, I was in retail for brands like Chico's, FAS, and FTD, and Rosetta Stone, and the Kroger Company. And uh, just recently, I took a position with one of the platforms that I installed at one of my retailers, Fabric. Uh, obviously, I love the platform, and that's why I'm working with them and bringing some retail credibility and expertise to the software industry. And next, I'll turn it over to Katie. Hi, um, I'm Katie Persino. I oversee e-commerce at J. Crew. I recently came from Madewell. I was there um, for over 10 years, so I've been with the, the group for a while. And right now, I'm really responsible for um, driving conversion. So always looking at data and how we can use that to target experiences to convert the customer. And now, Angel. Hi, I'm Angel. Um, I work at Petco, and I'm leading personalization and customer experience. Um, we'll be talking about a lot of those things today. Uh, previously, I was at Home Depot, Sephora, Albertson, so a lot of retail. And then before that, I was at uh, agencies. And we've got to spend some time together over the last couple weeks, as you do when you prepare for these. And I noticed a LinkedIn profile update or a LinkedIn update from Angel. So you also are an entrepreneur. Tell us just a teeny <laughs> bit about that. Yeah. Um, I, my friends and I started a gaming company, a game board company. So if you like game and car, uh, cards and games, um, check out Licorice Circus. We just started. Um, if you want to be a tester of games, I can, I have some for you. Like, so, <laughs> so it's really exciting because it's, it's basically taking all of the things that I do uh, in my real life and doing it for fun in my pretend life. So. I love a shameless plug. Yeah, thank you. That's and nice. if I can, more shameless plugging. Um, on your tables is Petco Love. It's part of our nonprofit. So there's some t shirts and things for pets. And so um, please take some. Um, and if you want something that's not on the table, if you a t shirt, just let me know and I can see what I could do. Cool. So the, the premise today is going to be uh, calling on the 27 years that I was in retail. Uh, there's, there's a couple of things that I. I have fundamental beliefs in and number one is every retailer is going through some sort of transformation or massive change or should be because keeping up is is tough uh, in retail and it's fun uh, and and certainly when you think of omni-channel or connected commerce or, or or universal commerce having that experience be super consistent so you can bring that brand message consistently at every single touch point is super critical. We're gonna to focus today on what I believe uh, and what we've talked about are the two main components. Uh, so if you were to have two takeaways from this panel's expertise, the two main components that you need to have uh, in place to go through a successful what I, you know, massive change or transformation or digital first strategy, and that is culture. Uh, which sometimes can be a challenge in some companies to get everyone rowing in the same direction. And the second one is data, uh, easy access, centralization, so you can use that data in a manner that is both transactional quickly to make decisions, but also can bend experiences on the fly. And if you don't have those two building blocks in there, then the challenge becomes much greater. So we're gonna, that's where we're gonna focus most today, but before we do that, we'll start with Katie this time. Where are you on your seamless omni-channel journey, making everything super consistent with that brand messaging? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a journey and something that J. crew has been tackling for you know as many retailers for years and years, but I think um, the customer now, you know, their experiences aren't linear. They're experiencing multiple touch points at once. So 
a customer could be walking down Fifth Avenue, they could see a social ad or an ad on Instagram, click through, um, or just pop into a store and then see a style they like and want some more, I don't know, like outfitting inspiration or want to know how do other customers feel about this product? Like, does it have high reviews? And so um, when we're thinking through things, just really making sure that you come through as a brand consistently across all of the touch points is hugely, hugely critical because the customer is often experiencing like all of these channels at the same time. So that's definitely we, something we strive for. You know, there's always opportunity and areas where we can continue to improve. Um, but that's, you know, something we've been embracing at J.Crew to try and kind of move the needle on. And a follow up for you, uh, Katie, is it's not just the shopping channels, but it's the marketing channels. It's Absolutely. the post post 100%. order activities that happen with returns and customer service and everything. Right. Exactly. And, you know, we, we pride ourselves on having such amazing associates in stores. So kind of also then making sure we have a great support team at the call center or, you know, being able to assist a customer online and making sure all of that's consistent is really, really um, a priority. And so where you've been on the journey for several years, and we'll talk about some of those successes, Angel, you're a little bit more early in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the transformation phase. So tell us yep. a little bit about Petco. Yeah, I haven't been at Petco as long. Um, I've been there less than a year, but part of my role is to bring like a, a unified customer experience across all of the channels from marketing, store, our call center. Um, we have vets and grooming services. And, and then to top it off, to personalize the experiences. And so we have lots of different customer types um, and lots of different pet parents. And so pet parents uh, might be, you might be a pet parent of a dog, a gerbil, a cat. They have different life stages, different needs. And so really we're trying to understand the needs of our pet parent. Um, and it's difficult sometimes, so it's just like children, to like figure out what's the right food, when should they be groomed, when should you take them to the vet. So we want to be um, that provider for all of those things in different life stages for the pet um, and the pet parent. So we're just starting out um, in some areas, and so I've been at a lot of different retailers, and it all kind of starts with data and the culture of want to be customer-centric, customer-first, and have that experience um, in every touch point. And so there's things that we're doing really great at Petco, and there's things that we have like really great opportunities to even do better. So um, I'm excited to be a part of that. So I'm going to follow up. I'll go reverse order. I'll start with you. So <laughs> I've worked for uh, retailers where going through some sort of, of massive change where there was just universal uh, disagreement on how to approach or you had conflict between stores and online or conflict between marketing and technology. And a lot of the job uh, in my previous two CDO roles was to try to break those silos down. I've worked at other companies where I came into where there was already an incredible amount of support and buy-in and it was more of a plug and play and it was more about figuring out the biggest problems and putting solutions in. But getting that culture of belief that every one of these touch points matters equally and everyone playing together is super critical. So first of all, you know, do you agree with that? And second mm -hmm. of all, where, where are you on that journey, on the cultural journey at your yeah. company? Yeah, I, I have been doing, um I'll say like personalization or um, building out the, the technology stacks um, and, and some of the teams for a long time at different different companies with different successes, of course. Um, Sephora is like really good at personalization, but it was a transformation. Um, I think everybody wants to get to that unified experience, personalization, um, but it's really a journey. Uh, and we talked about it a lot. It's a multi-year journey. It's kind of, I don't want to say kind of expensive, it's very expensive to do. And it's starting with the data. And when you talk about that with retailers um, and organizations and culture, they don't necessarily want to, to spend you know, millions of dollars, three years investing in data. They want the personalization and that, that really great experience. Um, so it's really part of trying to change the culture. And I always say like building out the technology and the, the teams is really easy. It's changing the culture that's really hard because everybody is trying to do their very best, but then they do their very best in a silo. 
And unfortunately, that's not for the benefit of the customer. And so you really have to break down those silos and say, my data needs to talk to your data. Our tools need to be integrated. Um, it might be a slow journey um, at the start, but it's really you know to make the best experience and the best tech stack uh, for the benefit of our customers. So I 100% believe in it. Um, the culture and uh, breaking down those silos is probably the most difficult part of it. And uh, I, I'm going to. I have a follow-up for both of you that we did not practice, but I'll get to that after, so just be ready for that. Uh, and how about uh, at, at J. Crew the culture? And I know you've been on the journey a little bit longer. Uh, you know, where was it and where is it now? And, and talk about some of the successes and maybe an opportunity yet to be had with regards to culture and buy-in to the whole, whole journey. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think the culture is there, and, and it starts with leadership, but it does, it takes time, and it, it really, it does take time to build out that foundation of data, which is the number one, you know, thing you need in order to be able to personalize, um, and I think what's worked for J. Crew and Madewell is, you know, kind of putting together the plan of, like, where we want to be longer term, um, but trying to get those wins along the way. So, you know, starting with, okay, if we're able to get capture this data on site and we could do some targeting here, see some quick wins, great. Now, what if we could also, you know, um, connect that with other data points and what would that open up for stores and just kind of selling the dream a little bit, but um, starting, you know, kind of coming up with what the plan is for how you want to structure the foundation um, and what the end goal is, but then trying to get those smaller wins along the way to prove out, you know, it's worth the time that it takes um, to build out that foundation. Yeah, when I was at uh, uh, Chico's, the, the biggest thing that I was worried about was the conflict between stores and e-commerce. And then you kind of have clienteling in between where you're trying to bring that personalization to the digital. But I found that if you spend a lot of time, this is my follow-up for you, you've spent a lot of time at the stores. So there is a top-down component of this, but there's also a bottoms-up component, spending time with the people who are actually doing the work, the call center agents, the, the store associates. Do you find that to be true at J. Crew? Absolutely. We value the feedback from our store associates and call center like in a huge, huge way. The teams react to it all the time. Um, you know, they're on the front line talking to our customers every single day. So um, we, we find that hugely valuable in making sure that the, the org um, gets to understand that information and where, what our customer wants um, and then react to it and make sure we're meeting them, you know, in terms of what they want from an experience. And then Angel, a follow up for you. When you go to make a decision on a, a to prioritize the, the roadmap or the sequencing of the problems you're trying to solve. So everybody starts with the problems and then there's an architecture of the solution or, you know, and then there's an execution of that. How is that process inside of Petco and how, you know, how much buy-in do you have over that or is there a contention between the two? Uh, between different groups, or is it is it fairly unified? Um, I, I think it's a little bit of, of both. It's a, sometimes it can be a little bit. I, I don't want to say contentious, but there's not agreement. <laughs> like so, in in some of the conversations. But I like to really think about like the north star. Um, I hesitate to say like five years because the, the everything changes and and two or three years, but I like to have that five-year vision because that's really when it starts to kind of rock and roll and become like that machine. But then you kind of work backwards and have the use cases, have the excitement, the small wins, um, but always try to build towards that North Star. Um, I do like to think about the technology, but then also who's using the technology in the process because I think I've been in roles where we build out like the Ferrari of technology, but we don't have the maintenance crew. We don't have the garage. We don't even have anybody with a driver's license to drive the Ferrari. <laughs> um, so you really have to kind of think through that, and that goes back to like talking to the internal teams. And so it's really this multifaceted kind of problem solving um, and being able to agile, be agile and change. Um, so if you have this five year vision and you need to like, take a U-turn or, you know, take a left turn or whatever, you're able to do that, um, but at the same time, keep going towards that that role and, or that uh, goal. And so I think that's what's kind of nice about, um, you know, my role. It, it sounds kind of awesome. It's not necessarily always that awesome some, sometimes, <laughs> but it's primarily focused on the customer experience and personalization, and, and that's the goal that, that our teams are trying to do. 
Okay, now we'll crack open uh, the, the data box here and we'll keep it uh, around two areas. So when I think of data as, as sort of a career CIO and CTO, I think of two, two main use cases. One is giving, and it's all about raising the digital and the data IQ of the entire organization. And one way is through providing reports or information to all the different groups across the company where they can make super rapid decisions and they don't have to go through 20 page workbooks in Excel, but it's just really rapid decision making. And then the second part is using that data in even a more transactional fashion to bend the experiences that, that when, when, when the customer you know, slams into your company, you know enough stuff and that data is readily accessible to then provide an experience that's, no, that, that's personal. So where are you on your data journey, Katie? And, and how's that working out? Yeah, I mean, data is definitely a priority for J.Crew. It's like, if not 100% of my job reading data or understanding data, it's like not, it's up there. So, um, you know, I, I'm looking at it all the time to just understand um, the trends of the business, the customer, where there are opportunities and that type of thing. But just as important isn't, you know, the tool, like an analytics tool to be able to read that data, but to have that information in other places so that you can react. Um, in a you know in a quick way or react and de just deliver an experience that is meaningful to the customer. So, you know I think that's something um, that should be really important for retailers. It's important for J Crew. You know we're working to build that out. But again, it takes time, um, especially the um, like integration of the data and consistency across all the tools. Like you know all of that takes time, um, but it's it's definitely important and it it allows us to be able to deliver on experiences that are relevant for the customer um, when it makes sense. Yeah, I think that's, uh, and, and do you feel like if you, if you went back a couple of years that the, I call it the data IQ has increased in your company because definitely. there's now just a general appreciation for data? Totally, definitely. And then it's also like just the kind of understanding of what things need really robust analyses, like really going deep and you know digging into it and then what things can you just kind of react to quickly and say like, okay, this one over this, like we're gonna move forward with yeah. that. Um, I, I think for sure the data IQ has developed. And you mentioned that uh, product management in your group, for example, now is very cognizant of the performance of what's going on on the web. There's more and more 100%. people that yeah. know what's happening day to day. It's not just isolated in a silo. Definitely, for sure. And then Angel, how about uh, data in your company and how important is it and how universally understood is that importance and where are you on that journey? Yeah, I'm. I'm going to say I'm kind of like a data snob. Um, I started out in analytics doing multiple uh, Excel workbooks and I hope people love data as much as I do. Um, but I try to look at it kind of a, a holistic view too. So we have a lot of quantitative but we also have a lot of qualitative from a lot of the research that we do with our CMI team or UX team because it's, it's basically they did X on the website. But why, why did they do it? And so we kind of look at it, uh, we kind of build data upon data upon data. Like we have the personas, uh, we have the analytics behind it, we have like heat mapping tools, um, but we try to make data sexy and exciting because basically that's the basis of everything that we're working towards. And so a lot of the things, um, I probably take out the, the fun and excitement of marketing and product management sometimes because Everything should have some sort of metric um, and some sort of customer impact before we build it, before we think about it and decide it. Um, and that's really important for parts of my teams because I own some of the data platforms like the CDP um, and how we do marketing and all of the different omni-channel touch points. And then if did the personalization platforms and initiatives, did they work or not? Um, so. Sometimes that's uh, not as fun as you know just doing some like marketing campaign and throwing it out there. But I think it's really impactful because it it helps us learn. And at the same time, like I think if we can make it like fun and exciting, then other people will like start to adopt it and go like, oh, now I know what a CDP is, and they didn't know. Can it create was a wave. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, is the uh, is when you think of uh, here's another uh, not practiced question for you both is. <laughs> When you think of the discretionary spend and resources that every company has, and a lot of it's capex for companies, sometimes it's not, but you have discrete, you have options to spend money somewhere. And when you go to spend that money and you've come to an agreement, how focused are and how disciplined are you on number one is 
understanding the metrics of the problem, and then as you're rolling out and as, or, do, or doing some some change, tracking those metrics to make sure that you that your hypothesis at the beginning is is actually true, and you raise conversion ten basis points or NPS two points or whatever that is. And how important do you think that outcome based implementations are in your company? And we'll go the other direction. Um, I don't really do anything unless I have metrics. Um, a lot of the companies I've owned the PL, and so it, if I want more money the next year, I do have to say, here's my 50, 60 different use cases, here's the OKRs, KPIs that I'm, I'm moving, and then this is how much it's gonna cost from a CapEx, OpEx perspective. And so um, I like to, to have that number and go, look how much money we can make. Um, and then, you know, hopefully be beat it quarter by quarter uh, as we start to go. Because like I said, a lot of the things that we uh, I ask for um, are very expensive to implement and to build engineering product uh, experience teams around them. So I, I don't think you can get away with just saying, I want to do X and you know it's going to Here's my conversion. Gut. Yeah, I, I think gut marketing is, is not necessarily a thing and either is building anymore. Um, how about it? How, how about it, J. Crew? The concept of outcome-based, and then following up with that, those outcomes after you put something new into play. Yeah, I mean, I think kind of to your point, like it, we don't really prioritize a project unless we we think or we've heard the customer wants that, um, and where we're pretty certain it's going to drive um, performance. So. Um, typically what we try to do is have when we launch something some sort of holdout to just really understand like what is the lift you know we thought it would be a 10 basis points conversion lift are we seeing that yes or no great okay um, should we scale it to 100% should we keep the holdout that kind of thing but that just helps kind of like close the loop when you do launch these projects um, to ensure that you continue to get that investment and you're able to continue to prioritize different things going forward. Yeah, and I find with conversion especially, uh, which is which is definitely a, 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 a one of the four or five key metrics uh, at the top level that you really have to have some sort of control or something because you could have a particular sale going on or a new season yeah. of clothing that comes out and there's all kinds of things that bend conversion, so making that as narrow as you possibly can becomes super, super critical. Yeah, and I think just really getting specific about the metrics. So like I said, conversion, but is it like add to cart? Is it yeah. products? Down, food? down like, a level. Exactly, and really focus on that um, because there, could, there can be so much other noise happening. Bounce rates and everything. Exactly, everything. yeah. That's, uh, that's fascinating, and I think the days, at least my experience is, is early on when I would do a CPR, and claim some sort of ROI after the project was over and a lot of these were, were waterfall big things. We never really like had the discipline to go backwards to find out if we realized that ROI. In today's world with incremental rollouts, the, the finance department is much more keen yeah. to understand along the way you know, how that ROI is coming because you can pivot so, so quickly now and, and change directions. Uh, in a more of an agile fashion. Okay. All right, two more real quick questions. We have two minutes, so these are quick hitters. Uh, thing you're most proudest about since you've been at your company, a success you've had or that your company's had or a barrier you broke through? Um, well, we launched a CDP, I'm, I'm excited about that, um, and a journey orchestration tool, but I think the most, most proud is uh, I've got the UX team to be integrated in almost every part of the business, so we are really thinking customer-centric. <laughs> And then I, I hit them hard with the data side as well. How about you, Katie? Um, I think just the willingness to be able to try things and test things um, in as low lift of a way as possible, learn, and then like move on. And either you know that's that's been um, something I'm really proud of and excited to be a part of. Um, and also, you know, I've spent I've I've been on this J Crew a few months now, but I'm really focused on the J Crew app, and I think. Um, that's such a, it's such a great, if you guys don't have it, please download it, it's amazing. Um, we deliver really good experiences to the customer that are like special and um, I'm just super excited to be working on that. That's cool. All right, last question, 30 seconds each. If you could wave, 20 seconds each. If you could, because I'm gonna wave my magic okay. wand too. If you could wave a magic wand within your company and either break down a barrier or have some success or have something happen, uh, what would it be to accelerate? Oh, um, I totally cheated when you asked me that last time. I said I want to fast forward like three years and all this <laughs> stuff to be like done. 
Um, so I can get into the fun stuff of being able to do like personalization and, and the really, really fun stuff, not the building and breaking barriers. Yeah, I think um, the one challenge, not necessarily a roadblock, is just like there's, there's so many vendors and plat platforms and use cases and opportunities out there. So it's like really being dil diligent about figuring out what is going to be the most meaningful to the customer and to the business. I'd say that's like probably kind of the biggest challenge that um, I face every day, but also it's the fun part of the job. Yeah, I think I'll close with uh, that when we talk about culture and data, and this actually hit me last night, is how important these two things are uh, to me and, and to us because we've talked about it. But when you choose, this is all we've talk, talked about everything inside our own company, but when you're choosing a, a software integrator or a platform or a data provider, the same type of thing. You want appreciation of culture that fits that what you're trying to do and you want an appreciation of outcomes and metrics and data that you're trying to do. So when you fit these anymore, you can't really afford the time of picking something that doesn't fit, even if it's technology that's great, but maybe it's not culturally sound. So I still maintain that data and culture are super, super important pillars, even when you're selecting outside your company. Yeah. How about a round of applause?